get any news is cut content regarding ReZero Season 3, Episode 4. Garfield's true despair and Super's preparation for war. And you know what the saddest thing is? I've already shown you in the engagements, you know, videos, the analytics of what people actually care. People do not give a fuck about Garfield's emo backstory right now. Garfield's like drama. Like, don't you dare tell me that you actually care for Garfield. I've seen the numbers. Garfield shows up. He's like, you know, traumatized and talking about his like feelings. Nobody, everyone just skips. And then they all just skip to the next fight. There's a lot happening in ReZero right now. Amelia and Felt have been captured. Priscilla and Otto are nowhere to be found. Garfield has to help his mother find his siblings, then Subaru and the others need to free the city from its captors. I'm worried there about are Otto. all events going on simultaneously, and that doesn't even include the smaller storylines of the side characters. So, while Season 4 does switch things up with the way the story is presented, the way it bounces around actually kind of works. It makes sure we're relatively updated with the status of everyone, all while maintaining focus on that bigger overarching conflict. I am a bit worried they haven't done this yet where uh you know in like one piece or any other fight where so many different things are happening like a start they start hyping up a fight scene they build it up and as soon as they're going to start fighting they skip to the next scene and then all that momentum that you built up is just dead and i'm like what the fuck and then they build up another scene and they're like oh big fight's gonna happen here then off screened to the next scene it's just like fuck you just like focus on one specific thing please Reezer has been doing it pretty well. This does come at the cost of some additional depth though, so where we should have gotten more info on Capella, Al, and some others, we instead kept our focus on the main cast. It leaves quite a bit to cover in just one episode of cut content. This cover so, pick is rather so than cool. do one long half hour video, this one will be- Also, I think that we know who this person is too. Obviously this one is Teresia if you've seen the cut content, right? Divine, uh, protection of the Grim Reaper, the Death God, right, at the attack, it, it makes sense. Probably Pandora, you know, fake the death, I'm not sure. But this person is that eight-armed person that was spoken about in the cut content in Valakia. Specifically when we were mentioning about how there was a media, you know, worshipping and, and, and exuding the cloud of a different witch and Regulus was sent to destroy the city. There, there was mention of a guy with many arms that Regulus fought and quote-unquote Defeated? Killed? I don't know. But if it is that person, it's kind of interesting how there is this repeating like pattern of behavior where everyone seems to die, then they respawn at the church of the cult. Like church, like the witch's cult. Like how how does that make sense, bro? It's it's not a protection that gives you six arms. It's a specific race of like multi-arm people that exist in Valakia Empire. And like it's just so weird how everyone just keeps dying. <laughs> And they just respawn at the cult. One episode of cut content. So, rather than do one long half hour video, this one will be split into parts. First, okay. the extended meeting and Garfield's conflict, then after that, the operation and how it really went down. Both have some pretty interesting details you're probably going to want to know about. But, but first, first, have you ever <laughs> wanted to form your own... <laughs> I always call out those fucking ad reads. Sometimes it's, uh, before we start. But first, that's always good. Which cult disaster response headquarters, covering chapters 3 and 4 from volume 17 of the light novel. With Capella's name being revealed as the culprit behind everything, Super was both surprised and unsurprised. Surprised because Capella was an archbishop he's never heard of before, and unsurprised because knowing her identity was a given at this point. If there was one golden rule these deranged archbishops always followed, it was the fact they always introduced themselves before doing anything. Yeah, they always do that. I even made a joke in another video where I said, yo, does the cult literally teach you on like day one, like how to be an Archbishop 101? You have to introduce yourself as, hello, my name is this. I represent, I'm the Archbishop that represents this sin. Like, like they always do the same intro. And at this point, I feel like it's very intentional. Like, this author does not do stuff randomly. It's a repeating behavior. Every archbishop does the same fucking cookie-cutter intro. Why? It's hilarious. It was as if they all had this desire to stand in the spotlight. Now, there were a few logistical questions Subaru wanted answered. Like, why was it that a business was being used as a disaster response headquarters? Priscilla Based Penn. on what he knew about companies in general, it wasn't normal for them to turn their place of business into a shelter like this. Well, as it turns out, 
The main reason is because the building was owned by Kiritaka. Pritzer the person ten. Subaru didn't really think too fondly of was actually a lot more considerate than he may have thought. Reason being that, as the leading member of the city's council he looks so of ten, rich. it only made sense to look out for the people he was responsible for. He was actively assisting with the evacuation himself, all while- We should also talk about the mana crystal shit. But, I don't think it's possible- uh, Um, I think people were theorizing how to get Biako back, she needs mana. But she can't take mana from anyone except Subaru? I, f I forget if that's an actual rule. But like, this existing mana crystal just- Consider it like a battery. I don't think it's gonna work. While taking time to properly dispatch those who could assist even further. So, if even Krush and Wilhelm are vouching for his character, then Subaru knew Kiritaka might not be as bad as he thought. Okay. In fact, if not for Kir Honestly, Kiritaka is chill. He's a very reasonable person. It's just the first episode, for whatever fucking stupid reason, Subaru entered the room pretty much just holding the lolly that Kiritaka worships in a weird way. Like, those are the weird moments where I, it, people are just pissed off about Subaru's like, behavior sometimes because of that, because it's, it's just so stupid, but that just like ruined their first impression. I don't think Kiritaka's a bad guy. I think he's pretty chill, except for that one scene where he pretty much just tried to explode us, but if you really think about it, right, how Subaru entered the room with the girl that he like pretty much like worships, it kind of makes sense. Kiritaka and his quick decision to turn his business into a makeshift field hospital there was a good chance Felix wouldn't have been able to save Subaru's leg at all. So, it was in that way that Subaru actually kind of owed him one. Al had even gone so far as to refer to this as lucky, but for Subaru he knew luck had nothing to do with it. If it did, then Subaru felt he wouldn't have died multiple times to get to this point. To him, he just wasn't the type to believe in fortune anymore. Yeah? You don't believe in fortune anymore, yet you have the power that you can fucking keep redoing over and over again, but then you could say that he's an unlucky person for having the responsibility and the burden of that power to keep suffering. He had stopped doing so ever since the day he was isekai here. The group then went on to discuss the people not present, starting with the most obvious Priscilla. As a royal princess candidate herself, you'd think Al would be more worried about her safety, but in- Yeah, what happens? We... well... Liliana, Priscilla, Amelia, Biako, Subaru, we were all there. That was the first checkpoint. And then after we left, I don't know. It's just Priscilla and Liliana. They might be together. Who knows where they are? In actuality, he wasn't too concerned at all. Yes, he was a bit scared, but that was mostly for himself since Priscilla was going to punish him for sure. There was no way she wouldn't considering his lack of presence during such a crucial time like this. Julius and Ricardo had escorted Felix here, then immediately left to go check up on other shelters. Their plan was to contact Felix should they find anyone who needed his help, all so they could save at least one more person. The whole thing made perfect sense to Subaru, except for the part about contacting Felix. Reason being that, in a world where the total count of cell phones was one, the conversation mirror media was quite the surprise for Subaru. I mean, with the way Felix pulled it out as if it was the most common thing to exist, Everyone that even one. went to catch me off guard. As it turns out, though, the mirror was actually a spoil of war from last year's battle against Betelgeuse. Yeah, we had it this was shit. something Anastasia had been keeping ever since. Its full capabilities allowed it to connect to three other mirrors just like it, so all in all it was quite the useful tool for communication. Now, Otto's whereabouts wasn't too much of a concern for the good thing is that people actually still remember Otto, meaning like his name was not eaten, so we'll keep our fingers crossed. Subaru, since when it came to staying alive, he was second to none. When all was said and done, Subaru truly believed he was the last person to slip up in a situation like this. It wasn't something he'd willingly admit out loud, but that was the glowing opinion Subaru had of him. This is actually pretty similar to the feelings Al has towards Priscilla, since just like Subaru with regards to Otto, Al trusted she could take care of herself too. Yeah, it just, I'm, I'm sure Priscilla's fine. Like, I'm sure she's just chilling. It wasn't something he was very open to admitting either. Now, when it came to the others in the Amelia camp, Subaru believed Garfield was probably fine too, and Patrash was sharp enough to take care of herself. I haven't seen Patrash She in a was while. currently safe at an inn settled up alongside Frufu. The one- Frufu? This is Otto's, uh, Land Dragon's name? The one party whose absence was a bit worrying, though, was Felt, Felt and her missing knight, <clears throat> Reinhard. The last anyone had seen from either of them was Felt running after the person who ruined their mornings. 
Fuck Kainkel, bro. Like, this dude sucks. I can't believe people say that this is the most well-written character in the show. And if Subaru wasn't here, then he would be the main character. Like, fuck that. That's so annoying. But I guess, you know, he's got to do a 180. Like, he's, he's, he's like the worst of the worst right now. And he can only get better. I, I get it. But right now, he fucking sucks. It was a thought that caused Wilhelm to tense up a bit. Obviously, if Reinhardt was with her, though, then her safety wasn't really anything to worry about. So after- Like, no one! I, I am not intimidated by this old fuck here. Who cares? Both Felt and Reinhardt, they could take him out. Felt is literally just playing along with it. I'm sure she could get out of the situation if she wanted. It's just the fucking political aftermath regarding the Reinhardt estate and, you know, the, the Von Austria estate and all the different things, you know. We don't want to go against him. It's going to look bad for us in the future. It's like, fuck this shit, man. Safety wasn't really anything to worry about. So after every absentee was thought about and accounted for, the only wild cards were Priscilla and the songstress. There was no telling where the two of them could have run off together. Getting back to the main problem at hand, the archbishops were essentially holding 100,000 people hostage. As one of the five largest cities in Lagunica, it made evacuating everyone almost impossible. Sure, they could technically do it by walking right out the main gate, but with an enemy-controlled control tower right next to it, being discreet just wasn't feasible. It was a dire situation Subaru was surprisingly calm about since only a year ago he would have been freaking out about saving Amelia. Look at that growth. Look at that development. As someone who's grown from his experiences, though, he now knew losing his cool wouldn't save anyone. His last outburst already caused Amelia to get abducted, so that was a mistake he was desperately trying to avoid again. It was an admirable notion that really resonated with Wilhelm. For some personal reason or the other, he was very invested in helping Subaru and Amelia. Yeah, I mean, Wilhelm treats Subaru like the grandson that he never had, because Reinhardt and them is just, just awkward as fuck. So, while Wilhelm's support came as quite the comfort for Subaru, for Al, who was watching the whole interaction go down, he seemed interested for a completely different reason. Such as? He didn't say a word the entire time it was happening, but the way he stared made it seem like he wanted to say something. Say something, Al, and if you say something, I guarantee you no one will ever question what you fucking said. Even though you're dropping the biggest fucking bombs of ReZero, ain't nobody confronting about it. It was enough to get Subaru to ask what it was. Al didn't have any reason in particular, but he did say how he was thinking Subaru was pretty twisted. Hmm. It was a vague response that came with all sorts of implications. Twisted how? What action did he did we do then Al say we're twisted? Twisted because we have a shitty personality? Twisted because the actions that we're doing right now contradict what we should be doing instead? What does that really mean? Beyond Subaru's like flawed personality traits that we've been going over since season two. Subaru couldn't figure out what those were right now, but the off-putting nature of it made Subaru more wary of Al. Or maybe he says you're pretty twisted too, bro. Kind of speaks about the potential, you know, authorities that Al and Subaru may have. I mean, Subaru definitely has one, but Al may have one too. There's like witch's scent coming from him too. This brings us now to the discussion about Capella, where quite a bit more was given for her backstory. Not the Capella we know as the Archbishop, Emirada. though, but instead the Capella who Lust stole her name from. So, aside from Sak Go back? Quite a bit more was given for her backstory. Not the Capella we know as the Archbishop, though, but instead the Capella who Lust stole her name from. Capella who Lust stole her name from. As in, this Capella stole Emerada Lugunica's name, is what he's saying. But the word steal is very, very thought provoking. So, aside from succumbing to illness at a very young age, it turns out her death wasn't mourned by anyone. Where normally a state funeral would be held and- Is this some overlord art again? The formal ceremony put on, neither were done since the people had no desire to. Yeah. The excuse was that the times were too dire, but in actuality it was- They just hated that bitch, right? Like, Capella- no. Emerelda was supposed to be such a- Outgoing smart person, but she could be very, very cruel, which is a personality trait that we see in Capella. And um, people just didn't like her at all. I mean, she died. Like, like Lugunica did not even like acknowledge that shit. It was just like, nope, don't worry about it. Go on with your days, peasants. It was simply because no one liked her. So the processions, which were hers by right, were completely ignored due to the cruel, sadistic nature that she was known for. 
Apparently, wherever she went, an unfathomable darkness always seemed to follow. The fuck? It's for this reason her death was even kept secret for a while, and that to Wilhelm will forever be one of the kingdom's greatest indignities. It clearly wasn't something he was comfortable talking about. At least now everyone knew Lust couldn't be the old Capella, so to Wilhelm, it was likely she was just trying to harass those who did know her. Hmm. Harass those who did know her. Why would she go out and do that? Because she actually cares about Emeralda? If we assume that these two are two separate people, then why would that happen? And then let's just think about the whole age thing too. And yeah, it's a fucking lolly. There's no chance that this is just like a 15-year-old kid, right? This could be like a 9,000-year-old being. But if you think about it, Emeralda is a very old person, right? Existed like 50 years prior. Age-wise, this doesn't really make sense. But again, lolly body, maybe it doesn't age for whatever reason. So you're going to tell me that this person that we see here, Lust, the Archbishop, knew Emeralda in the past and is now going on, you know, with her name and trying to piss off people that were mean to Emeralda before because they were close. And then you're going to also tell me that the blonde hair, the fangs and not quite red, but pinkish eye is just a coincidence. No, it's got to be the same person, right? One way or the other, it's got to be the same person, right? Perhaps to invite suspicion or simply lay mistrust, but either way, it was a disrespectful act that clearly intended to disparage the royal family. Something Crucian and Wilhelm weren't very willing to just accept. To me, it just kind of feels like they faked her death. I don't know. Maybe they didn't fake her death, but she got away. I don't know. Something, a fallout happened. She got away. She joined the cult because... Fuck Lugunica family for treating me that bad, and now she goes on treating people like this. There's a lot of different theories that you could go with this, but it, it is the, the Lugunican royal family traits again, right? The blonde eyes, the red eye, the blonde hair, red eyes, and fang. It's just way too obvious, but maybe it, it is that simple. Maybe it's not a red herring. The one who was affected by it the most, though, was actually Felix, who was now very visibly angry. It was rather rare for anyone to see him like this, but the expression- Because of the EX side stories, right? Felix made now was one of pure, genuine anger. As a royal guard whose sole purpose was to protect the royal family, such disrespect was desecration of the highest order. But the royal family ain't even give a fuck about Emeralda in the first place. How are you gonna get mad at Capella? for quote-unquote tarnishing the royal family's name when this person might have been the actual Emeralda that was shit on by the own royal family. That was the apparent reason for his rage on the surface, but there was something else too clearly bothering him. Something that didn't have anything to do with fealty or the kingdom. Hmm. Now, there wasn't any anything else? Well, we know that there is a bit of, you know, a side story of these two being very fr close friends with another Lugunican, you know royalty member that died before Subaru arrived, but other than that, I can't imagine what it could be. Fealty or the kingdom. Now, there wasn't any point trying to understand the witch cult's intentions, since trying to do so was likely just a waste of time. Yeah, their intentions, they're a bunch of lollicons, and they're here to dig up Tifon's bones for bone fucking broth. All hail Pandora. I don't know. What the fuck is their goal? They did say that the bones has a power, right? What did Kiritaka say? Deep, deep below, Tifon's remains do exist, but you cannot retrieve it. The, her remains are associated with some sort of power, which was not really explained further upon. But they also said that, like, we can't retrieve it, because if it does, it's pretty much the equivalent of, like, destroying the city, right? The most important thing right now was figuring out how to navigate this. They knew what they wanted and what was at risk, so all they needed to do now was figure out the best path forward. The whole thing was actually so out of character for the witch cult, since to see them use hostages as a means to an end, well, that was a level of logic and rationality Subaru just wasn't accustomed to for them. As for what they wanted, the witch's bones were something Subaru couldn't initially fathom either. With Satella supposedly slumbering in a land far away to the east, the thought of her leaving her bones as a relic just didn't make sense to him. Especially with her statement about how- And this is, of course, like we're assuming that the witch's remains could have been... Satala? What, what are we, why are we thinking it's the witch's envy right now? It's, it's Tifon, it, it's already been told. Maybe this is before Al says something or someone else says something. How she wanted Subaru to kill her. That made him adamant that she couldn't be dead, 
leading to a visible panic at just the thought of it. Her words and his promise forced him to reject any possibility that Satella could be dead. It was also told that like her flesh was never destroyed. Can you confirm that Tifone's flesh was destroyed right now then? I mean, she has the remains. It, the wording is fucking obscure as usual for ReZero. But like, which of Envy was like sealed away? Yet the flesh was not destroyed was mentioned in like Arc 2. And we've seen the Witch of Envy literally pull up in Season 2. How the fuck did that happen? Is the seal even a real thing, bro? Is it just like a weakened seal where she can like leak out? Can she break that shit? Did someone else break it during that time? I don't know. That's when Al would interject saying that it could be other witches, eventually leading to his subtle statement about Tifon. Here we go. It was a name he didn't expect to hear coming- THANK YOU! Someone else saying Tifon instead of fucking Typhon. Who the fuck is Typhon, bro? I ain't ever heard of a girl named Typhon in the anime. He didn't expect to hear coming from him, but one he hoped to inquire about if he ever got the opportunity. Given how cryptic he was when he said it though, it was another instance where Subaru believed Al knew more than he was letting on. Yeah, maybe you should fucking say something about it then. So, he was very curious to know if the youthful girl he met was- No, but people won't fucking say it. They genuinely, they won't say it. And I, I, I want you to bring your attention to this. Some dudes literally do mental gymnastics to defend how the storytelling fucking makes Subaru obviously not be able to tell this shit, right? If he, if he were aware of the fucking secrets, right? If he just confronts him of all the in information, then there's not really any point to the storytelling. It's supposed to be mysteries kept in secret. But there's these dudes that genuinely do some fucking mental gymnastics. And they genuinely think that they're onto something. Let's see. To be fair, it would be quite suspicious of Subaru if he just asked, how do you know the Witch of Pride by name? Why would it be suspicious? We're asking a question, especially considering that Subaru's reputation of not knowing shit about some very common sense subject for the ReZero characters. So? You think that like us simply inquiring about that suddenly puts us in like the, on the most like suspicious characters list? I'm just inquiring who is the Witch of- and the Witch of Pride's not even a fucking common thing. That's the other thing. Bro, it- when you mention the Witch in this fucking current era, motherfuckers think Witch of Envy because of they only remember that. Pre-fucking Calamity 400 years ago, yeah, people are aware of different fucking witches that exist. But this is not just like common knowledge. That's why everyone assumes that. So like, why do you even do dumbass fucking mental gymnastics to argue? You're literally arguing for the sake of fucking arguing. All you have to do is say, yeah, this is pretty annoying. And for the sake of storytelling, I understand why they're doing it. But monkeys will literally try to fucking do the stupidest mental gymnastics. I would say a good explanation of why Subaru won't ask uh, how do they know to other people why. Because Subaru himself cannot explain how he knows. Why can't he? Why can't he? How he know what? How he know what? I'm asking. Asking a question about how do you know about Witch of Tyf Pride is not confirmation that I myself understand that. I'm literally saying, Witch of Pride, can you talk to me more about that? It would probably just make him look and feel like a hypocrite who is asking other secrets without wanting to reveal his own. And hypocrites? What are you fucking talking about? I'm literally asking a question. Al. Who is the Witch of Pride and how do you know her? This is not common knowledge. This, like, what the fuck is this mental gymnastics that you're fucking doing right now to defend this fucking annoying thing about fucking ReZero? I personally don't mind Super not constantly asking everyone around him questions about everything. Why? Why? Aside from that fact that he often doesn't have the chance to give him which has already been mentioned, I don't think any of the characters would even give a serious answer to Subaru. <laughs> what kind of fucking argument is that? At the very least, we can ask. That's what I'm fucking annoyed about. If they didn't give us a fucking answer, then I'd be like, oh, okay, fair enough. But at the very least, I want Subaru to fucking use his brain and be like, holy shit, this is important fucking information. I want to fucking ask. Subaru asks Al about how he knows Stephen or Gluttony. Al can simply give some excuses. Yeah, but he didn't even fucking ask. That's the fucking thing, you retard. I'm upset not about the answers that we're getting, but the fact that we're not even asking the fucking questions. Like, holy shit, people are brain dead. What else is here? The info, T-Phone, died, just in, okay. The info about, who the fuck is Typhoon, you retard? You raised to the point that nobody even has any idea which witch died here. Okay, and that's why I'm asking. If nobody, see how monkeys are literally contradicting 
over and over in the comment section. Other dudes are making comments saying, if we ask, we look suspicious because we know the information. Because it should be common knowledge. No, it's not. It's not fucking common knowledge, you fucking monkeys. Just imagine Super asking Al about how he knows the name of the witch that drowned here. Why would it be suspicious? Why would it be suspicious? This is common knowledge that is not common knowledge. I want to ask, who the fuck is even the Witch of Pride and how do you know Tifo? He will start to wonder how Super knows such info. He doesn't mean he knows such info. We're inquiring about a question that was completely erased from history. Exactly. That's the thing. How stupid are you? Read your own fucking comment. You're saying it will be so suspicious a super inquiring about mysteries about this world, yet other retards are saying this is common knowledge. Me simply asking about this mystery that most people don't know is not suspicious. I want to ask, you're talking about the Witch of Pride? I only know about the Witch of Envy. Shit, can you tell me more? So your argument is the one that doesn't make any sense. That's, this is the most infuriating thing. Genuinely brain-dead retards thinking they're smart Thinking that they actually got me when it's just full of contradictions. Why was Subaru Riz drawing the suspicion of a cautious guy like L? What fucking suspicion, bro? What suspicion? I'm asking why you mentioned Witch of Pride T phone when I myself and right now we're under the guise we can play dumb. Of course Subaru fucking knows, but this information is not public, and him asking about that doesn't suddenly confirm that Subaru is in on the fucking secret. There's no suspicion here. Subaru has the right to be suspicious and wary about to being upfront. It's just fucking stupid. All I read are genuinely brain-dead retards trying to fucking reach and do the stupidest fucking mental gymnastics so that they can have their monkey comments heard. Here we are. I'll fucking farm your dumbasses every fucking day. It genuinely blows my mind mind how you can't just sit there and just say like how 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 is the normative position not this is annoying i can't believe he didn't fucking ask all the fucking questions when the most important people are in front of us like in the fucking tea party yet again all you have to do is this is fucking annoying but i acknowledge due to the storytelling and the relevancy of the mysteries that not everything can be given perfectly fine I literally state that in the video. And then you retards literally do the stupidest mental gymnastics, sharing one brain cell, all contradicting each other, genuinely fucking brain dead. I can't imagine being that fucking stupid. Was the same one Al was deep in thought about. If it was, then the thought of her demise being used as the foundation for this city really was rather unsettling. The rest of the meeting went pretty much the same, aside from a minor scene with Anastasia taking a hard stance against terrorism. Knowing the witch cult would just kill them should they give in to their demands, she was pretty adamant to- She literally is saying we don't negotiate with terrorists. ...about not negotiating with them at all. It made it so the only two options were to fight or flee. It was then that Garfield would arrive with Mimi, leading to the flashback explaining how it all happened. A tragic turn of events starting of course with Capella. So, as she introduced both herself and her vivid disdain for humans, the unsettling nature of it all caused Mimi's smile to disappear. It made her carry an expression Garfield knew didn't belong on her face, and for some reason that made him very uncomfortable. This was of course signed to regroup with Subaru and Amelia, but not before first encountering Liara. What happened next was a deep internal conflict between what he needed to do and what he wanted to do. You see, he was caught between fulfilling his duty to the Subaru and Amelia camp, or helping his mother and the siblings he just recently discovered. It was a decision that brought into question who he was and everything he valued in life. Like, if he wasn't with Subaru and Amelia, then what use was he to them? At the same time, his two siblings were still technically his family, so it wouldn't be right to turn his back on them either. Let him die. So, what had finally pushed Garfield over the edge was Liara's pitiful attempt to convince him not to help. After seeing just how hesitant Garfield was, she quickly understood it wasn't right for her to ask him this. It was a reaction that reminded Garfield of the day she left him. Just like how she did back then, she was clearly trying not to saddle others with duties they weren't obligated to take on. A heartfelt consideration that immediately made Garfield's choice obvious. You of course, Garfield knew he couldn't saddle Mimi with those obligations either, but as soon as he told her not to tag along, Mimi quickly made it clear that she was going to help too. Both were decisions the Aura simply couldn't understand right now. Given how to her he was just a stranger, it didn't make sense why he would go so far for her. 
I wonder what's gonna happen if she did indeed lose the memories due to gluttony and we defeat gluttony and if the memories actually return. What will that be like? A great conclusion for Garfield? Some kind of closure? Maybe? It was when she finally asked that the only answer Garfield could give was that he was the Golden Tiger. That was all he said before jumping- Golden Tiger? Not Gorgeous Tiger? Jumping away to fulfill his promise. In the end, Garfield knew putting off his duties was reckless, but what he found while doing so was that following his heart was easiest. Rather than wrestle with this incredibly tough decision now, he decided to instead focus on what was in front of him, then think through what had happened later. It was the way of fighting the Amelia faction had taught him. Why choose one when you can just take everything? Now, as for where the kids were, their lingering scent revealed they had gone to the park to see the songstress. This meant they were likely in a nearby shelter, one that in order to get to, they first needed to pass City Hall, the location of Liara's husband and the center of Lust's operations. This presented Garfield with yet another tough decision, since he could either ignore the man who stole his mother and go find his siblings, or stole. try and save him and maintain his mother's newfound happy lifestyle. Uh, I feel like we need to save him. Stole? He didn't steal anything. He's honestly doing us a favor. Mom finally has like a good husband that she can rely on. He was, after all, the one who saved her life. So, though Garfield wasn't connected to him by blood, he understood the impact of losing Gallic wasn't something he could just overlook. As someone who knew all too well himself, a blank space in the family was one that could never be filled. So, Garfield being Garfield decided right there that going for the source of the commotion was best. Should've fucked off, should've listened to Mimi, should've listened to Mimi, like, I get it, like, literally? He wants to save dad and the siblings, that's why we got to the square. But once we saw Teresia and the multi arm race guy from Valakia, we should've gotten out immediately and listened to Mimi. Garfield's pride in his ego to fucking challenge strong people caused Mimi's injuries, it's that simple. For the source of the commotion was best. If he could beat Capella right now, then everything should resolve itself faster. Should. It was logic that made complete sense to Mimi, but at the same time had her intuition ringing all sorts of alarm bells. Should have left. knew he needed to be careful too, but based on what he knew about witches from his time in Sanctuary, when it came to strength, he wasn't worried at all. Yes, he understood they had quite a bit of power, but from what he could tell about the one in Sanctuary, he honestly felt that she would never beat him in a contest of strength. It was a mindset that- Well, yeah, because the kid is a bookworm. She ain't got- You saw that one break time episode, bro? She can't do shit. But to his simple mind, he's justifying in his head that every one of them are going to be that weak. That gave him confidence in his ability to fight lust. So after equipping his shields and gearing up, that's when him and Mimi would finally approach City Hall like how we saw in the anime. His plan was to overwhelm the- how the fuck did this shit get- I remember during the fight against Elsa that Garfield's like double shield shit. It got- it got broken. Right? It deadass got broken. I guess they could fix it. It's not that big of a deal. It's been like a year plus. ...and gearing up. That's when him and Mimi would finally approach City Hall like how we saw in the anime. His plan was to overwhelm the enemy with speed and violence. He figured that this was the best approach since from what he was told about Super's encounter with the witch cult in the past, the Archbishop's disciples weren't really anything to worry about. Oh yeah, if they're just simple fingers, if they're just rank and file employees, they do not matter. And we assume that Teresia and, you know, this Valachian eight-armed guy was probably just another fodder guy because they were, had a hood on, right? No. Fuck no, these are pretty much mini-bosses. Those weren't really anything to worry about. Yes, there were quite a few of them, but individually, each weren't very strong at all. Not they these were two. a problem he figured he could just handle on the fly. What Garfield came across instead, though, was a pair with an aura so incredibly hostile that aura. just being in their presence was enough to understand these were masters who've stepped beyond the realm of mere mortals. Yep. To compare them to an opponent we would understand ourselves, stronger each than Elsa. was equal to, if not stronger than Elsa. Ooh. They were enough of a threat to know facing them unprepared would be suicide. This was a fact Garfield fully understood, but getting himself to accept it was a completely different story. Reason being that, to him, they were nothing but a wall he needed to challenge and overcome. Since his strength was the only thing he had pride in, to turn tail and run after just losing in strength to- 
Here's the thing again, if strength is the only thing that you have pride in, if, and if you're nothing without that strength, maybe you don't deserve it. Right? Like, you fixate on this one specific thing, that it just makes up who you are, you're so fucking proud of it, maybe you shouldn't have it. Who are you without it? For Reinhardt, well, that was simply unacceptable to him. Now, the fight itself was relatively similar, but to highlight some of Garfield's thoughts throughout, he was genuinely shocked by how light the lady was. When his foot made contact and pushed her away, he was thrown back by just how light she felt. It was here that Garf's greediness would proceed to get the best of him since where he thought he could at least take out one, instead turned into him getting jumped by both. He was bombarded by an onslaught of- It was 2v1 pretty much. It genuinely was. Mimi, Mimi was offering support, but she wasn't- she's not really, you know, taking one other dude out. It's kind of crazy though if you think about, like, these two, assuming who their identities are, if that is true, like, how crazy of a battle this is, 1v2. Perfectly refined swordsmanship from the woman, and crude heavy blows from the giant. One flowed like water through a river, while the other destroyed like a storm ravaging everything. It was a mind-numbing beatdown that Garfield could barely keep up with. The only reason he was able to avoid death at all was because instinct alone helped him to parry the hits that would have been fatal. Everything else he just took head on. Now, something that really stood out to me after this was Elsa's line which translated differently in the novel. Hmm. Rather than her saying she's gonna kill him, that love for Garfield instead came from the fact he killed her. Yeah, I thought it, that time was kind of confusing because she constantly says this shit over and over. It's just like, you killed me, that's why I love you. Or rather, will kill her. Both didn't really make much sense to me. You will kill me that you are my first love. I'll love you only after I kill you. It is because you will kill me that you are my first love. Will. In the future? Bish, you're already dead right now. Are you stuck in the past? Metaphorically. How does this make sense? Uh, the fact that Elsa's still in Garfield's mind as a Delulu schizo moment is the fact that she's still quote-unquote alive, and until Garfield overcomes that, he hasn't truly killed her. And once he does overcome this Delulu, you know, Elsa moments, then we will surpass the state and Elsa and Garfield will become one and he'll become even more powerful. Sure, why not? But what they represent is the invitation of death. Either way, the battle would continue with Mimi having to save Garfield, eventually resulting in Mimi's injury. They could have gotten away had Garfield stuck to the plan, but because he was so caught up in trying to be the strongest, he would now have to face the direct consequences of his Bruh. actions. The near death of the person who helped him cry. Garfield better just clutch like crazy. He's just been taking so many L's. He's so unstable. He is so just mentally, emotionally volatile. And just more just L's. Like, are you gonna, you better fucking clutch up. You better literally solo Capella like I saw in the opening. I know the opening is just fake spoilers to hype up the audience, but you got Mimi like this, you better figure this shit out. So, the moment Garfield realized that she was injured, he quickly found somewhere safe, then set her down so he could try and heal her himself. This was something he'd spent the last year learning, since if anything happened to those from Sanctuary, he wanted more than anything to be able to help them. It was for this reason he put his heart and soul into learning healing magic, and this moment right here was about to prove his efforts. It was the exact situation that he'd been preparing for. But when the wound he was treating didn't end up closing though, yeah. despair and desperation overwhelmed him. All that time he'd spent learning how to treat wounds just like this was completely useless in the moment it mattered most. Couldn't save Ram, couldn't save Mimi. What should have been an opportunity to show how far he'd come was instead turned into yet another failure. So, as he panicked more and started speaking his thoughts out loud, Garfield didn't even recognize the voice of the person talking anymore. It was so frail and weak that it couldn't be his. This was no time to wallow in his own despair though, since what mattered now was saving her. If it meant giving his life in exchange for hers, that was something Garfield was ready to do in an instant. I mean, Mimi's not dead, and... Just like Wilhelm, you can live with this injury. It's just gonna suck because you're gonna be bleeding. Then again, Wilhelm's injury is on the shoulder. Mimi's is like cut across the stomach. That is quite a lot, right? A shoulder injury opening up and bleeding out. It's not the death of you, but your stomach like that. Ugh. So how do we def get rid of this? I'm not sure how we cleanse this shit. Felix can't do it because Felix is a fraud, as usual. I am 
It's crazy the Felix Glaze, and Felix literally can't do shit except just heal random NPCs. And yeah, that's like a great thing to do, but like, goddamn, when we need you the most, you're the strongest fucking wa like water magic user. You can't do this? All right, what do we do? Uh, beat Teresia, kill her, actually end her, and if then you know that divine protection, I guess, goes away. But what if it can be inherited by someone else if they had a kid? I don't know how that shit works, but seems like the only answer right now is just to literally end Teresia. He kept calling for a miracle as he jumped from rooftop to rooftop again, looking for anything or anyone that could help him. With not a soul in sight though, the only thing Garfield could do now was rely on his senses. It was a last ditch effort which would eventually lead him to the person he was looking for. The man that to him completely symbolized miracles. He was the Subaru. personification Jesus Christ himself performing miracles of hope in the most dire of situations. So if <laughs> I love how everyone else also asks him, right? Even fucking Julius is like, yo, you got some secret plans? Any any secret sauce? Any secret come on. You you solved the white whale and you know Archbishop of Sloth before. <laughs> or like we don't have enough fucking runs. I, I don't have enough information. We'll figure it out. Anyone was gonna be able to save Mimi, the general in front of him was the person to do it. Now, the next part pretty much segues into the operation to retake City Hall, so I think right here is a good place to stop. All right. You can expect that video in a few days or so, or you can come see me talk about it early over yes, on sir. my stream on Sunday. Y'all know what to do. Please go give Mr. Any News a like on the video. Here's the link. Please check it out. There's a multi-part series that's coming out, which I'm actually all for, because it just means more farm for me. I'll see you next time.